and thank you to Fee for inviting me. Um, what I want to do tonight is to talk to you a little bit about um, the great French economist of the mid-19th century, Frédéric Bastiat, and you pronounce his name without the T at the end. It's Bastiat. Um, that's one of the peculiarities uh, <coughs> of the French. And I want to stress three things. that uh, Many of you might know him as a political uh, economist, but he was also a, a campaigner for free trade at a time when uh, protectionism was very strong in France. He was also a journalist. He then became later in his life a political theorist, I mean an economic theorist, um, and he was also, interestingly, a politician. He was elected to the uh, <coughs> Constituent Assembly, then the National Assembly, in France in 1848 and 49, so during the revolutionary years. And that experience, I think, is very interesting to, uh, to study and to follow. But before I start that, I just wanted to <coughs> tell you about some of the handouts that uh, you might have received. Um, please make sure you have one of these um, DVDs. This is a data DVD called the Portable Library of Liberty. And this data DVD contains over 1,000 full text titles. So there's 1,000 books on this. And this is a subset of the titles that we have on the online Library of Liberty. And th this is in a PDF format. Um, and so please take one, they're free. We give them away to anyone who requests one, and we've given away 21,000 of them so far, which is uh, quite an achievement. Something else, um, Liberty Fund does a number of things, one of which is to publish books. And these are beautifully bound and uh, well-edited uh, books, classics of um, free market economic thought, of constitutionalism, rule of law, history, philosophy, and so on. And uh, we are announcing on our current uh, catalogue the forthcoming publication of um, volume one of the complete works of Bastiat. Here we have uh, Monsieur Bastiat um, on the cover. Uh, Liberty Fund uh, has taken 10 years to get to this stage. It's been a laborious project. But what we wanted to do was to publish his collected works, uh, which have never been translated fully into English before. Um, we have less than half of his um, work uh, so far in English, and so there's a lot more to come that will be of, of considerable interest, I think. And volume one, which is his letters and some of his political essays, will be coming out next month. And of course, um, many of us who, came, who became familiar with Bastiat's writings did so through Fee's publications. Um, when I was a a mere uh, lad in 1973 at high school, I came across um, Frédéric Bastiat and bought um, these uh, fee editions and for 50 years they have been the prime way in which people in the English speaking world have become familiar with the ideas of uh, Frédéric Bastiat. So this is his selected essays of political economy. This is about a third of the essays he wrote on political economy. This is another collection of his um, writings, Economic Sophisms. And these were um, short um, essays that he wrote for the general public to expose economic falsehoods and contradictions and what he calls sophistic ways of thinking about the economy. And he was a very gifted uh, journalist. Um, and so this uh, collection is, uh, I would strongly recommend to you. And again, we are publishing about a third more of these that have not yet been translated into English. So uh, <clears throat> that's by way of plugging Fee's um, books. These will all become redundant soon, because when Liberty Fund finally gets around to publishing its complete edition, um, these are the Liberty Fund ones will, I think, be the ones that uh, you might want to, to look at. You should also have um, two handouts, two photocopied handouts. One, a lecture overview, and the second one, uh, some selected quotations um, by Bastiat. And I'll be referring to those um, during my lecture. Something else that you should be looking at in your own time, excuse me a moment, on the lecture overview there is a list of web pages and sites um, that I recommend and um, Liberty Fund has a number of websites and there are others that are also useful for furthering uh, your knowledge of, about Frederick Bastiat. So that's all by way of introduction. Let me um, proceed to the lecture. See if this works. There must be some dense heads in between here and the. There we go. Um, <laughs> Liberty Fund um, has a number of um, resources to do with Bastiat that I would recommend to you. We have a website called the Library of Economics and Liberty, or EconLib for short, 
which is um, a collection of podcasts, of uh, blogs, um, and other essays on a, that are published on a monthly basis, and a wonderful encyclopedia of economics. We have the online library of liberty, is what, is, which is what I direct and control. We have a book catalogue, which I've already mentioned to you, and we have a forthcoming uh, translation of the collected works of Bastia in uh, six volumes. This is some more information about EconLib. The web address is on the uh, lecture overview. These are some of the books published by Liberty Fund. And what's interesting is that Liberty Fund not only sells these books, and some of them are the premier um, scholarly editions of, for example, the works of Adam Smith. Um, we're doing a new library of the works of Ludwig von Mises down here. And then we're soon to have uh, Bastia. But we also put all these books online and offer them free to the public. So you can buy them very cheaply for $12 or $15, or you can get them for free on the web, which is uh, remarkable. And these are some of the major scholarly collections in economics that we have. Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, and soon to come, um, Bastiat. Let's see. The Online Library of Liberty I've already mentioned to you. Um, we have all sorts of other educational resources on, on that site. Timelines, bibliographies, biographies, uh, all sorts of um, audio uh, material. We have... Um, in lectures and discussions in MP3 format, uh, which you can all download for free. All the videos, sorry, all the audios are also available on this um, DVD, so you don't have to go to the website. That's the title, that's the cover of the, the, the new first volume of Bastia, which is coming out uh, next month, as a matter of fact. So let me just talk briefly about uh, what I want to cover in this lecture, and there's an awful lot I could say about Bastia, but... Um, I thought it would be interesting to see his place in the history of economic thought because he plays an uh, interesting role in the development of economics in the 19th century. Um, I think he is a considerably important uh, figure who was not only important in um, Europe but also in America, uh, especially in the, second half, in the second half of the 20th century. In the post-Second World War period, he was rediscovered by uh, English speakers, especially here. I want to talk a little bit about his life and how he came to be the person he, he became. What are some of his key ideas? And I want to look at some of those ideas through the quotations, uh, the selections I've, I've just given you. And then something about his legacy. And um, I've also written some limericks about um, Bastia. And I plan to form a rock band called um, <laughs> Freddie and the Free Traders. <laughs> And um, I'm trying to come up with some songs that, we can, uh, that he could play at his gigs. And if anyone could come up with some good songs, I will give you a free copy of Volume 1 of his works when it comes out. So uh, I'm serious about this. Um, let's try and get uh, Bastiat's um, position <coughs> in some kind of uh, focus here, because it can be very confusing for people who are not experts on this field. One of the things you have to remember is that Bastia is uh, protesting against a number of economic um, ways of thinking and of policies that emerged in the 17th and 18th century, and this goes by the name of mercantilism. And this was the uh, policy adopted by most of the absolute monarchies of Europe, and the idea behind uh, mercantilism was that um, the state should maximise its exports, minimise its imports, uh, make sure that the treasury had plenty of money, and this was uh, why, why taxes of imports was important. Um, they wanted to have uh, import substitution. They would have subsidised key industries to produce things which the state thought it might need in time of war. Um, in many ways, uh, some of the policies that of modern governments today are very much in the mercantilist tradition. You probably were nodding your head when I said some of the things that I just said. And so that's why this line here is dotted. It continues well into the 20th century, even though it's practically died out as a sort of intellectual force under the challenge of two competing schools of thought. One was the Anglo-Scottish classical school. So people like Smith and Ricardo and John Stuart Mill developed their ideas in opposition to the mercantilist doctrine. That their argument was there should be uh, less government control and regulation of industry, there should be free trade internationally, there should be free trade internally, um, the government should lower taxes and allow business to flourish, it should allow anyone to set up any kind of business whenever they wanted to, and um, this was a completely different way of thinking about how the economy should work. Now, a very similar tradition 
It was appeared also in, the, in France in the 18th century and 19th century. And the French, of course, being the French, said, uh, called themselves the economists. Right? There was no need to qualify the noun economist with an adjective because uh, everyone knew what they, what they meant. It was the free trade, free market economists. And so people in the 18th century like Turgot or in the early 19th century Say and then Jean-Baptiste Say and then Frédéric Bastiat are important members of this school. And one of the key differences between the French economists and the uh, classical school as, as it emerged in England was over the <clears throat> basic ideas that justified individual liberty and free markets. In England, under the influence of Jeremy Bentham, who influenced John Stuart Mill and his father James Mill, the doctrine of utilitarianism became extremely important in 19th century English uh, economic thinking. And the idea behind um, utilitarianism is that um, you can at various times violate someone's property rights if it's in the public interest. Right? That's still a very powerful argument that people use today. And the idea is that uh, someone in a capital city like Washington or London can add up what social utility might be and figure out ways to maximise that social utility. And if it means violating someone's private individual utility by taking away some of their property and giving it to someone else and thereby maximising what you might call social utility, then you should do it. And that's the function of government. And that was very strong in the English classical school. In the French school, it's somewhat different. Um, they had a much stronger and much more longer-lasting idea or defence of liberty on the grounds of natural rights. And the idea was that you had a right to your property, your right to your, yourself, the right to engage in transactions with other people as a natural right. It was part of what being human was all about. And no one had the right to take that from you even if they said it would maximise social utility in some way by doing this. And so that gave a harder edge to the French school. They were much more um, insistent on the idea that the government should not take your property, should not violate your rights, should not interfere with your economic transactions. And in about the 1830s and 40s, we have uh, the emergence of what I call the French and German socialist school. This was a, uh, a reaction against the classical school in England or the classical the economists in France. And here we have people like Saint-Simon, Proudhon, and Karl Marx. And this was a major um, uh, area of opposition, uh, especially for Bastiat. He spent a lot of his time attacking the new socialism that was emerging in the 1830s and 1840s in France. Um, and later in the 19th century, uh, we see the emergence of another school of economic <coughs> thinking called the Marginalist or the Austrian School. So if you've heard of the Austrians, Ludwig von Mises owes his, can trace back his roots to people like Karl Menger writing in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s with a new and different way of looking at why people engage in economic activity. But I won't have time to talk in, about that, perhaps in question time. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that you had some indication here of mercantilism being the sort of established view, two challenges to mercantilism, which were free market, deregulation, low tax, pro-industry, pro-consumer, and there was the classical school in England and, and the French economists in France, and then the emergence of socialism in the 1830s, complicating matters. So that's a bird's eye view of what's going on in economic thinking in the 19th century. So I've already mentioned uh, some of those uh, ideas already. Now Bastiat is important because um, he is very much involved in these economic uh, developments in economic thinking. He, engaged in, he was always willing to engage in ideological uh, conflict and discussion and debate, uh, which makes uh, reading his in works uh, so interesting. So he's attacking traditional ideas of protectionism and government subsidies and favouritism for particular industries. On the one hand, he's attacking the new socialist ideas that are emerging, in um, particular Proudhon, who was one of the leading socialist writers of the 1840s. Um, Marx came, um, was, began to develop his ideas after Bastiat's death, so he... He um, doesn't really play a role in Bastiat's thinking, but Karl Marx hated Bastiat. Hated him passionately because he was such a clear, articulate, and consistent defender of the free market. And so usually my rule of thumb is anyone but, uh, Karl Marx hates must be pretty good. Um, and I'll give you some of his quotes in a, in a, in a minute. Now, a number, you might have read or heard from um, some writings that 
a lot of uh, modern Austrians think that Bastia is a precursor, if not a, an Austrian himself, and that he developed certain ideas about uh, why, how people value things. Uh, he did it from a, a subjective perspective in many ways, and so he qualifies then, according to the modern Austrians, as a, as a proto-Austrian. And so they like his works very much. Um, but I see him as a transitional figure. He's not yet a fully Austrian um, economist in his thinking, but um, that's something we can debate about later on. <coughs> um, here are some abusive things that Karl Marx said about Bastia, which um, I was um, unfortunate in that when I was going to college, <coughs> Marxism was still one of the dominant ideologies. And uh, to get my degree in history, one of the, one of the uh, seminars I did was uh, a whole year of Marxism and history, right, two semesters. And one of the things we had to do was we had to read volume one of Kapital, which appeared in 1867 by Karl Marx. And I had to annotate every page and you know, take notes and so on. And what, as I read through this, um, I came across all these references in Karl Marx's footnotes to these classical French classical English and free market uh, French economists, in particular Bastia. And uh, Marx was very well read, and um, here are some of the things he said about Bastia. He said, the most superficial and therefore the most successful representative of apologetic vulgar economics. Right, the Bastia was typical of the sort of uh, narrow-minded, superficial defenders of the free market, you know, who are all in the pay of the big industrialists, who only believe these things because they were promoting uh, the interests of these business people. He called him the modern bagmen of free trade. Right? That the, the people interested in free trade were the wealthy industrialists and they were paying Bastiat to say what he was saying. Even though Bastiat would say, well, some of the greatest opponents of free trade are in fact the very industrialists who are going to have to face international competition. They hate me and my ideas. Why would I be the bagman of, of these uh, interests? And then um, he called him a dwarf economist. Now, I don't know how tall Bastia was, but um, he, he wasn't a dwarf. Um, but anyway, these are just some amusing things that, uh, that Marx had to say about Bastia. Now, I think Bastia is very important for a number of reasons, and I've tried to make a list of a few of them here. Now, he had a profound impact on 19th century classical liberal thought. Um, many of his books were very quickly translated into the major European languages, like Spanish and Italian and even Hungarian. Um, some of them were translated into English, and so he, he had a, a striking in, influence. Here's one, um, this gentleman here, um, John Prince Smith. Uh, even though he has this English-sounding name, he was actually German. He um, lived in Hamburg. And he took up Friedrich Bastiat's ideas on free trade and tried to create a German free trade movement based on Bastiat's ideas. Um, he's also interesting because he, in some ways, is a bit like the Ron Paul of his day, in that he was extremely articulate. He was well uh, thought, uh, he had well thought out the ideas of liberty and could articulate them well. He was a journalist and he was also a politician. And how he combined all these things together in a coherent whole is, I think, quite remarkable. Not many um, politicians were able to do that. He was a brilliant stylist. His writings, especially in, the, in economic sophisms, his journalism, he was witheringly funny, and one of his um, tricks was to take an argument of the protectionists and to push that argument to an absurd degree. So this is argument uh, ad absurdum, um, and the very good example of this is the petition of the candlestick makers or the candle makers, which I'll um, talk about in a moment. He. Um, was very much taken with the ideas of Richard Cobden, who was leading the free trade movement in England. He started the um, anti Law League in 1838, and it was successful in 1846 in getting the British government to repeal most, if not all, of the tariffs and regulations on um, imported goods. Um, and uh, this was the inspiration for Bastiat. He wanted to do the same thing in France, and he set up a free trade group in Bordeaux, in the southwest of France where he was from, and then he moved to Paris and tried to set up a national free trade movement. Unfortunately, the French were not so uh, lucky. They were, the free traders were defeated in 1847 when the, um, the chamber debated the free trade measure and it was uh, defeated, it, was, it lost. Um, so, but um, the Cobden was extremely um, influential on uh, Bastiat's thinking. Um, 
He was also one of the leading opponents of the socialist movement and what he did in Parliament, or sorry, the Chamber of Deputies, was to take on the socialists head to head. The socialists after the 1848 revolution wanted to push um, the government to introduce all sorts of subsidies and, and controls and regulations, including a thing of government payment to unemployed people. This was a completely unique phenomenon in Europe at the time. And um, they did this. It was called the National Workshops, and it was very popular, and Bastia opposed it strenuously. And, of course, it bankrupted the French state, and they had to cancel it. Um, and, but that's another story, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Wait, they canceled it after it was bankrupt? They, uh, possible? Uh, <laughs> they did. They, they did not have enough money, and they had to call it quits. And they, um, what happened was it sparked riots throughout Paris called the June Days, 1848, where thousands of... See, what happened was the, the, they said, oh, well, only 20,000 people are unemployed um, who need um, government assistance. And then they found out that 200,000 people signed up for it. Uh, that's very strange, isn't it? The more you pay, the more unemployment you get. Um, and it literally bankrupted the uh, French government, because in the middle of a revolution, right, their tax base had been whittled away, they didn't have the power to enforce tax collection. And uh, when they suspended the program, um, there were these riots, and they sent in the army. And the army started shooting rioters in the streets of Paris. Hundreds of people were shot. And uh, Bastiat was in this terribly uh, difficult situation where he had been appointed vice president of the finance committee of the chamber of... Um, it was the constituent um, assembly, then the national assembly. And he was the vice president of the financial committee. And he was involved in trying to bring reason to this craziness of, of the revolution. And uh, he strenuously opposed the National Workshops program. When the troops were ordered into the streets of Paris and started shooting people, he was actually on the streets trying to stop the troops shooting the workers. And um, his colleagues in the, in the chamber couldn't understand him. He said, on the one hand, you oppose the National Workshops, and on the other hand... So that's a, a right-wing issue. Right? The socialist left was supporting the National Workshops. And here's Bastia opposing um, the whole idea of National Workshops. When the, when the Conservatives order the troops into the street to start shooting, he's opposed to that. Right? That's a left-wing issue. So they said to Bastia, who are you? Are you a left-wing or a right-wing? And he said, no, I'm a classical liberal. I don't fit into this framework. You know, it's, um, I'm left on some issues and right on other issues. And that was his dilemma, um, the poor man. He was recognised by um, many of his uh, friends in the uh, free market movement as perhaps the leading or emerging uh, new theorist, um, and they, were, they wanted to make him the, um, the editor of the Journal des Economistes, which was the leading French organ for the uh, promotion of academic ideas on, on free markets. Uh, they said he was the equal of Turgot and Adam Smith and Jean-Baptiste Say, and he declined because he was too busy, he was involved in Parliament, um, and he hadn't yet written his major theoretical treatise. And then he died um, very, very young. So he um, never lived up to the, the promise and hope that his colleagues had. However, he did have a lingering um, influence in French politics. Um, during the, sorry, during the uh, Second Empire, one of the um, ministers appointed by Napoleon III was Michel Chevalier. And Michel Chevalier had been converted by Bastia to a free trade position. And Chevalier was then de uh, desig de designated by Napoleon III to enter into negotiations with England. And the representative the British government sent was Richard Cobden, who had been the great free trade leader in the 1840s. And Chevalier and Cobden signed a very important free trade treaty in 1860, which opened up um, trade between these two countries uh, as never before. And that was partly... To do with uh, the influence of Bastia. And he also has an impact here in America. Uh, one of his uh, followers in America was Amasa Walker, who started a, um, a Bastia school um, of thought in the late 19th century, um, but that didn't really survive um, the, into the 20th century. But the ancestor that, that... of the Walker in uh, Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, <laughs> unless his middle name is Amasa. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but then we... we he, he goes into this uh, unfortunate decline where um, throughout most of the 20th century he's forgotten. Even in France, or even today in France, he's forgotten. Uh, they're, they're so socialist, they're not interested in their own classical liberal heritage. But here are a couple of people who 
um, were interested in Bastiat and did a lot to promote an interest in him and his ideas. And of course, when I come to Fee, with Leonard Reed's um, important contribution, I feel I'm coming to the home of Bastiat in North America, uh, coming here, because what Leonard Reed did was, he, I think, the, the story was that he was a member of the um, was it Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce um, about the, during the war period, and um, he was giving talks maybe just after the war had ended, and someone in the audience came up to me and came up to him and said, "You know who you sound like? You sound like Bastiat." And Leonard Reed said, "Who?" And um, he was given a copy of some of Bastiat's writings, and he said, "Yes, indeed, I, I do sound like Bastiat, and I believe um, the same things that Bastiat believes in." And so Leonard Reed began this sort of one-man um, pro-Bastiat um, movement, where and he was eventually able to get. Um, not only these books translated into English and published by Fee, but also a very nice little biography um, about uh, Bastia. And that was um, done in the, in the 1960s. And um, that's where I think most people who know anything about Bastia have, have come to know him through Leonard Reed's um, activities. Now, another person is Henry Hazlitt. And I'll talk a little bit about him in a moment. Murray Rothbard is a modern Austrian economist uh, who, who thought that Bastia really was a precursor of the Austrian movement and his insights were extremely important and needed to be um, promoted and, and developed uh, even further. And we have Ronald Reagan um, who said that he had read Bastiat and had been influenced by him, um, which to some people is a bit hard to believe, but um, <laughs> it, it, did, it did constitute part of his worldview. He had read Bastiat and was familiar with some of his writings. But let me turn to Henry Hazlitt. Um, Henry Hazlitt was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times at a time, you know, in the, in the late 40s when it was a real dark age for classical liberal free market ideas. And he was um, instrumental in promoting um, Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist, um, favorably reviewing his Road to Serfdom of 1944. Um, he was a founding member of the Mont Pelerin Society, which was uh, um, instrumental in, in bringing together Europeans and some North Americans um, to, to, to gather and talk about free market ideas in the post-war period. Um, he was also wrote his Economics in One Lesson, which is a direct borrowing from Bastiat, and he acknowledges this uh, in his introduction, um, which is very interesting. Um, this, the Economics in One Lesson was published in 1946, and he says in his introduction, my greatest debt with respect to the kind of expository framework on which the present argument is being hung is to Frederick Bastiat's what, one, what, what is seen and what is not seen. This was his famous essay from 1850. The present work may in fact be regarded as a modernization, extension and generalization of the, pro the approach found in Bastiat's pamphlet. In fact, the first chapter of this book, Economics in One Lesson, is called The Broken Window, which uh, for those of you who've read Bastiat will know that's one of his um, most powerful um, stories about uh, how free markets work and how intervention can uh, cause um, damage. Later editions of Bastiat's work in French, and I've got the title page here, has as its subtitle, All Political Economy in One Lesson, which is the, the, the very title that Hazlitt gives his, his book in 1946. So this is sort of, uh, gives you some idea of the continuity um, that uh, goes between um, Bastiat in the 1850s and um, the revival of free market ideas in the um, post-Second World War period. Now, I've taken my um, discussion of Bastiat's biography. Um, I've borrowed this title, The Seen and the Unseen, what is seen and what is not seen, uh, to, to split Bastiat's life into two different parts. There is the unseen Bastiat, when he was a provincial magistrate in Hicksville, France. Right? He's in the southwest, and he's a magist local magistrate and a landowner. And he does nothing much down there except read. Um, which sounds a very pleasant um, life, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. If you want to find out more about Bastia and where he comes from, I've got more detailed maps and timelines available at my website where you can uh, find it. But basically, he comes from a town called Mougron, here in the southwest part of France, close to the Atlantic. He's on a river, and there's, uh, being close to Bordeaux, this is a wine-growing area. It's got access to the Atlantic Sea, so transport, foreign trade is very important. It's also very close to the Spanish border, which means, of course, smuggling was a crucial part of uh, the local economy, 
and they saw nothing wrong with that. Um, Bastiat is a great defender of free trade, or smuggling as it's uh, sometimes called. <laughs> the second part of his life, the seen part of Bastiat's life, was when he suddenly becomes famous in free market circles. And he um, goes to Paris and starts writing... A, um, in his entire output is, it appears between 1844 and 1850. So he's, he is just a dynamo um, in, a, in a short period of time. So that's the, the two divisions. And to give you some idea, here's a, a, a slightly more detailed picture of Mougran on the river and uh, its proximity. There it is there. Um, of course, they didn't have Google in those days, but um, I made use of it for my purposes. He's born in uh, 1801 in Bayonne, on the, the mouth of the Adour River, in the department known as Les Landes. And he represents Les Landes when he is eventually uh, elected to the uh, Chamber of Deputies in 1848. His father and his uncle and his grandfather were all involved in trade. They were merchants. And so Bastiat grows up in a, in a pro-commerce environment. He's orphaned at the age of nine, unfortunately, and is brought up by an aunt. So he doesn't really know his parents. Um, he uh, is eventually sent away to school where he, in a local town called saint Sever, And he has an innovative education, which I think is very interesting in, in trying to understand Bastia. Um, this was a school where they didn't teach ancient Greek and Roman uh, and Latin. They wanted to teach modern languages and history and even some commerce subjects, which was un practically unheard of. So it has a very practical bent. And Bastiat thrived on this. He loved it. He also learned music. And um, he took up the cello and kept the love of the cello and uh, of, of opera all through his life. So when he moved to Paris, he was particularly um, enthralled at going to all the, the opera and so on. Um, he is forced to leave school um, before he graduates and uh, works in his uncle's um, business. And then he inherits um, his um, grandfather's estate in 1825 and becomes a gentleman farmer. And uh, this could have been the intellectual death of, of many people, but Bastia took it as a positive. And what he did was, um, he spends a lot of his time just reading. 20 years of his life, he reads economics. He reads Spanish, he reads Italian, he reads French, of course, and he reads English. And he's, he does nothing but read the classics of political economy all this time. But he is interested in politics. When the, uh, when one of the, of course, one of the constants of French history is the revolutions. I mean, there's always a revolution going on, um, usually with good uh, cause. Um, he, the revolution breaks out in, in July of 1830. And uh, he joins with a group of people who go to the local garrison um, to urge the army to swing their support in favour of the revolutionaries against the increasingly conservative and uh, repressive... Um, government, the monarchical government, um, and he goes and has um, a drink with some of the officers in the local garrison, and they all decide that Bastiat is quite a nice chap, and that, yes, they will side with the revolutionaries after all. Um, so it swings the uh, revolution in, in the favour of the revolution. He then decides he wants to go into politics, and he's appointed to some fairly low, lowly positions as a justice of the peace, and then as a local councillor, and he gets a reputation for being a very good magistrate, that he provides speedy and swift um, solutions to legal and economic problems, and he's quite popular. Um, he also is a member of the local Mougaron discussion group. I guess it's a book reading club of some kind. And, this is, and it's in this club that he discovers, or he reads about in the papers, about uh, Richard Cobden and the anti corn Law League and the free trade movement in England in the um, early 1840s. And he becomes extremely interested and wants to read more about them. Um, so he discovers the Cobden's anti uh, Corn Law League and decides he's going to write an article about it. And this is when he begins to leave the obscurity of southwest France and his provincial life. And he writes this article comparing the French and English free trade movements and the beneficial impact that that will have on the English and French economies. And he submits it to the Journal des Economistes, which is the premier um, economics journal in the French speaking world in 1844. And he becomes a sensation. People read it and say, My God, where did this man come from? Um, and so this ends his obscurity, and he goes, starts mixing in French um, politics. And uh, this is a, a street in Paris, the Rue Richelieu. Down this street here is the Society for Political Economy and the Guillaume Publishing Firm. 
Now, the Urbain Guillemin was like the Pierre Goodrich of his day. Goodrich was the founder of Liberty Fund. And what uh, Guillemin did was he made money as a bookseller and decided he was going to use his money, his profits, to promote free market and free trade ideas. So he set up his own publishing firm, which for the next, so this is in the early 1840s, which for the next uh, 60 something years is the premier publisher of free market economic thought in France. He's in the same building, just down this road here, they set up um, the Society for Political Economy, which is like a monthly meeting club where all the economists can come and talk and they invite uh, bureaucrats who work in the government to talk about free market ideas and deregulation and so on. Um, so this is very important. Bastiat goes to these meetings. Um, they also have um, big booze-ups. Uh, they go to a restaurant and they go drinking all night and uh, they carouse until midnight. And uh, So it's, it sounds like a lot of fun. I just wish I could, uh, could have attended one of them. Um, <laughs> In 1845, he joins the. Um, uh, he, he writes a book about Cobden and the and the anti corn law league, which is extremely um, well read in or popular in France. And then he starts writing all these short journalistic articles called economic sophisms, where he wants to disabuse the French people of all the nonsense that they have in their heads about the benefits of protectionism and about the benefits of government subsidies and support for industry and so on. And this is some of his best writing as this this uh, journalist. Um, and he also begins to write more academic type articles, but uh, that's a, another, another matter. In 1846, he's elected a member of the prestigious institute. This is like a government subsidized research center, um, and he uh, willingly accepts that. He then starts various free trade groups to try and emulate uh, the successes of Richard Cobden in London. He has the Bordeaux free trade movement, and then he has the national movement in Paris, but it goes nowhere. He can't persuade the French people or French industry to support the idea of free trade. Part of the problem is that uh, it's seen as this wicked weapon of the English, perfidious Albion. If they're in favour of free trade, we the French have to be against it because the, the English are trying to get, get us and undermine us and uh, they can obviously see something we can't see, you know, that the, the whole point of free trade is to undermine French industry. Whereas Bastiat says, no, no, what it will do is it will allow French industry to compete better. It will get cheaper um, raw materials. We'll be able to um, sell our goods uh, throughout Europe uh, uh, and competition will improve the competitiveness of our um, industry. They will become innovative and uh, more receptive and to the needs of, of the consumers and so on. But uh, Bastiat uh, <coughs> eventually, I think, has to concede defeat on this question. And then the French Revolution breaks out in February of um, 1848. And this, watching what's been happening in Egypt and, um, you know, in um, other parts of North Africa, Tunisia and Libya and so on, it really is like living through 1848 again because in many ways that's, I think, the best comparison that could be made. That what happens in France, it breaks out in February 1848 and then spreads to most of the major European countries month by month. Um, toppling um, mon monarchs and introducing parliamentary democracy until it's eventually crushed, um, primarily because the Austrian and Russian armies are able to defeat the revolutionaries in Eastern Europe and then eventually crush the, um, the movement uh, throughout Europe. So Louis, King Louis Philippe, and here he is here in his finery, um, is forced to abdicate and a republic is declared on the 25th of February. On the 26th of February, Bastia is in the streets of Paris with his mates, one of them is uh, Gustave de Molinari, handing out literature on the street corners trying to urge the citizens of Paris not to go socialist. Right? And um, he founds a little journal called La République Française. And what's interesting here is that um, at that time France had what they call pre-censorship. If you wanted to publish something you had to have it approved by a government official and stamped and then you could take it to the printer and get it printed. So Bastia, being Bastia, a very law-abiding gentleman, said, well, <clears throat> we have to um, show this to the, uh, the Jew authorities uh, and get it approved, and then we can stand on street corners and hand out uh, all this revolutionary literature. So they go to the Hotel de Ville, the, the, the town hall, where the um, official has his office, and they find that the uh, town hall is in total chaos. 
Offices have been ransacked, files have been burned, tables overturned, people running up and down stairs with guns and everything. And Bastiat says to his friend uh, Molinari, he says, I th well, we've made a good effort here. I think the government, however, is uh, otherwise occupied. Um, so we'll just take it for granted that we've got permission and we'll go and... Uh, but then they... So they're running down the streets with their first edition of their little newsletter, telling the workers how bad it would be to go socialist and have all these taxes and, and regulations and so on. But they can't find a print shop that will print their stuff because most of the printers are either A, in the streets, revolting, or they're socialists and don't want to print free market stuff. So eventually they find um, a printer who's willing to, who's A, there, and then B, willing to do it. And they start up their magazine, but they find that someone else has stolen the name, so they can't use that name. So they call it Jacques Bonhomme, which is like um, John Everyman. Uh, in, in England, the name for every person was uh, John Bull. And in America, you might say that this is like Joe Sixpack. Uh, it's just trying to write material addressed to the ordinary person who may or may not know anything about economics. Um, and he and Molinari do this for, for some weeks before they eventually close down their um, operation. After the um, initial few weeks of the revolution, they do have an election to a constituent assembly to create a new constitution. And Bastiat is elected from his local region, Les Landes. And he goes, and uh, he's then re-elected later on to the Legislative Assembly, and as I said before, was appointed Vice President of the Finance Committee, which is an important and influential position. Uh, and that's where he conducts a lot of his sort of in-house political fighting, trying to argue for the, for the free trade position. And here's a painting um, showing um, Lamartine rejecting the red flag of socialism and going for a new flag um, outside the town hall in February 1848. Um, so very famous uh, picture of that event. Of course, like we've seen in um, North Africa, revolution also involves uh, killing, and there were barricades thrown up and rocks thrown and uh, people shot. Um, these revolutions are always um, quite uh, vicious. And here are some of the things that Bastiat does as a, po as a politician. He supports a motion to prevent civil servants also serving as elected representatives. He said there'd be a conflict of interest there. We don't want government officials who are receiving a salary also being in the parliament voting on whether or not they should be getting lower or higher salaries. This big issue here was the right to work. Um, this, the national workshops, which I've uh, mentioned. There was this big debate, you know, should the government limit the working day to a certain number of hours? Should it have a uh, required uh, minimum wage and so on? Should there be subsidies for the unemployed? And the big debate was over the fr this, these two different concepts, the liberté au travail versus the liberté, liberté du travail. Do I have a right to a job, in which case the government should also you know, provide it for me if I can't get one elsewhere, or do I just have the right to engage in employment and to seek employment? And Bastiat, of course, supported the latter, not the former. The socialists supported the former and not the latter. So they spent months and months arguing about this. And this is another example where um, Bastiat shows his colleagues that he's different. Uh, Louis Blanc was one of the agitators during the June days. This is when they closed the national workshops, there was rioting in the streets of Paris, the army was sent in and they started shooting people. After the um, uprising uh, of, of June was uh, brought to an end, Louis Blanc, the socialist, was going to be charged and convicted for participating in this riot. And Bastiat came to his defence and said, even socialists like Louis Blanc have the right to freedom of speech and petition. Um, and he was one of the strenuous supporters of, of Louis Blanc. He also votes against a ban on voluntary trade unions. They said uh, trade unions are uh, voluntary associations, or, or can be voluntary associations like any other voluntary association. The government should not ban them. Even though I am totally opposed to everything that, that these trade unions want and agitate for, I still believe they have a right to form. So and then there are some other issues there that I, I won't, don't have time to go into, but they're the, the main ones. And here's a list of some of his most famous books and essays. Um, they're on the, um, on the lecture overview, so I won't uh, go into those in any detail. Let me just briefly talk about some of his um, key ideas. And I've broken it down into four main components. And I think you will have got a sense of some of these from what I've already said in the lecture tonight. He has a theory of liberty which is based upon the notion of individual rights. 
Right, so he's, he's very much in this 18th century tradition of thinking about individual self-ownership of the right that inheres in you as a person, as part of your personality, of your being, to have control over your own body and the things that your body does, whether it's uh, to, to, to create things or to trade things with other people. And this is a, a fundamental right that even governments don't have a right to violate. Um, he therefore wants governments to be limited. And he wants one of the main ways to limit government is through the rule of law. So all these are fairly traditional, straightforward, classical liberal notions that I'm sure you're all familiar with. He also has a theory of economics, which is quite interesting, and that is this, this idea that the economy is a, harm a harmonious network of voluntary exchanges, unless it is disrupted by government intervention giving favours to some at the expense of others. If these, um, legis this legislation to give favours to some doesn't occur, and if you just have voluntary exchanges between people, this creates a harmonious network. Because I can't trade with you unless I offer you something that's going to benefit you. You will not enter into a trade with me unless you're going to benefit from something, from, from this exchange. So mutually beneficial trade makes for this harmonious network. Uh, but this is, of course, pr uh, predicated on the notion that there is an institution of some kind that will protect individual private property, so there's no theft and there's no fraud, um, and that also... Um, that there is an idea about contract and uh, the inviolability of contract uh, for, for, to protect exchanges. He also very much believes in this notion that free trade and peace are intimately linked. He said that one of the reasons why countries go to war is because of this mercantilist tradition of beggaring thy neighbour by having all these subsidies and privileges for your own manufacturers and producers and having high tariffs and taxes on anyone who wants to bring in goods from other countries. Um, that governments are also interested in seizing territory for uh, primary products, particularly colonies to, to, that they want where they, to, to get things like sugar. This is a source of war and antagonism with other countries. And that if you have free trade, you, do, you immediately remove all these antagonisms between nations under, if, if you allow um, international free trade. And uh, he was, uh, this led him into a very strong anti-war position where in 1849 he joined with Victor Hugo, the great French novelist, in uh, organising uh, one of the um, peace conventions uh, that were held in Europe in 1847, 48 and 49. Um, he was very active in, in that movement. And then he has a theory of the state. And because of his views up here about individual property rights and individual liberty, he thinks that when people, one group of people violate your natural right to your property and to your liberty, that is a kind of plunder. It's like when a highwayman or a pirate seizes you on the, on the, on the highway or the open seas, takes your property, that is a form of um, plunder. But he says also th this plunder can take the form of a legal plunder. What if the government becomes the institution which is violating your liberty and your property? It may be legal, the government may pass a law, but it's still plunder. And so he has this notion of legal plunder, uh, which is very interesting, and which I think makes him very attractive to modern-day libertarians who, who share some of these views. Um, let me just say something briefly about his um, idea about limited state. There is a big debate that goes on in... Um, so let me just get this uh, spectrum up. This is a spectrum of state power, and on the, this far extreme, we have like the total state. Fully planned economy, the government owns everything. Um, we call that communism. Further along, we have fascism, where the state directs a lot of private industry, but also controls uh, very large sectors of the economy itself. We have what I call the welfare warfare state, somewhere here in the middle. In modern in Western Europe, the welfare state is, is given more emphasis. And this is where there are huge transfer payments that take place within society. The state provides health, welfare, education, and there is enormous regulation of the economy. But also in the uh, United States, we have a welfare warfare state, where not only is there significant uh, government interference in, in health and education and so on, but we also have a very large military-industrial complex, which distorts the economy. 
um, and creates a huge vested interest that wants to see uh, high taxes and, uh, and so on continue. We have mercantilism, which I've already mentioned, and then we have these two forms of, you might call classical liberal or libertarian notions of what the state should do. And uh, one uh, definition you could give is called the minicist state, and I would argue that this is where Bastiat falls on the spectrum. That this is the notion that the government should do very limited things, it should provide defence, police, and some other public goods. Well, this was Adam Smith's uh, basic theory of the state. We have a variation of this, which I call the ultra minicist state, where th this is the notion that the government should provide defence and police, but there should also be considerable private competition and activity in some security services. It shouldn't be a total government monopoly. And then, at the far end of, of what I've called the liberty side of the spectrum, the fully voluntarist state, that all state activities are deregulated, privatised or abolished. And um, I've broken it down even further if you want to um, follow this. This is the minicist and um, voluntarist state end of the spectrum. So I think Frederick Bastias lies somewhere here with Mises, Rand and Robert Nozick, the minicist state. Some of, uh, Jean, uh, some of the followers uh, or other members of the French economic school, Jean-Baptiste Say, Comte, Dunoyer, and the older Molinari were the ultra minicist uh, supporters. And then at this far end here we have the fully privatised state. These people wanted the state to be totally abolished and all functions done privately and voluntarily. And we have Herbert Spencer in England, the young Molinari, um, the one who was with Bastia handing out leaflets on the streets of Paris in 1848, and Murray Rothbard, who's a modern um, Austrian economist. Uh, let me just um, direct you to the quotes. Um, we might work through some of those um, now so that we can uh, get some idea of what Bastia was saying. The idea of uh, voluntary exchanges being harmonious. Um, what Bastiat does is he says that he's asking himself, how is it possible that a huge city the size of Paris, all the citizens can wake up in the morning and there is food? Right? Where does it all come from? Who's, all, who's behind it all organising it? And he said, well, no, there's, there's no central planner in Paris, at least in 1848. Um, that there is the self-interest of the uh, food sellers who want to make a profit, so they bring their produce from the countryside. Um, there is the self-interest of the consumers. They want breakfast, they want their croissants, and they want their um, uh, ham and cheese, and so they go to the markets, and lo and behold, there is someone there willing to sell it to them. Um, so there's mutual and beneficial interests uh, being satisfied in all these uh, market transactions. And that what's very important is that the local producers around Paris know what the Parisians want and somehow I'm able to supply them with that. So if you look on page one of the handout, this is about the, prov uh, the provisioning of Paris. And he says, um, just the, the opening line, on coming to Paris for a visit, right, he's, a, he's an outsider, he's coming from the southwest, this would have been a shocking thing for him as a bumpkin from the countryside, coming to Paris and seeing this enormous uh, multi-million uh, city, uh, pe people city, uh, supplying itself with goods. He says, I said to myself, here are a million human beings who would all die in a few days if supplies of all sorts did not flow into this great metropolis. It staggers the imagination to try to comprehend the vast multiplicity of objects that must pass through its gates tomorrow if its inhabitants are to be preserved from the horrors of famine, insurrection and pillage. And yet all are sleeping peacefully at this moment without being disturbed for a single instant by the, right, by the idea of so frightful a prospect. And then if you go down to the bold... Um, Sentence, what then is the resourceful and secret power that governs the amazing regularity of such complicated movements? That power is an absolute principle, the principle of free exchange. So this is one of his um, short essays where he, I think in quite approachable form, makes quite sophisticated economic arguments that even uh, un un people who are unfamiliar with economics can, can follow. Um, let me go to another quote. Here's his um, theory of the state, and it leads into the next quote. One of the things that Bastiat is arguing here is that um, this third item here, 
is one I think we should focus on. Interventions for vested interest groups harm consumers. This is the petition of the candle makers. And what I've done is I've illustrated this slide with a couple of contemporary caricatures um, done by Honoré Dormier. And Honoré Dormier was doing this in the 1830s and 40s, so roughly contemporary with Bastiat. And here we have political leaders. One of them is even the king. This big fat guy here is the king. And because of his unfortunate shape, he was always drawn by cartoonists as a pear, in the shape of a pear, uh, which he hated passionately and tried to have them arrested and imprisoned for uh, caricaturing him in this way, which of course meant that they did it even more. Um, and you can see the pear shape here in the second one. So here we have all these lawyers and politicians and even royalty saying how much they respect each other and greeting each other by uh, uh, grasping each other, giving them hugs. And what are they doing? They're picking each other's pockets. Right? Each person is praying off the other person and trying to get a special deal, a special privilege. And this is what he's, uh, Dormier is saying, this is what politics is all about. Now another one down here is, I think I've got a bigger one of that um, here. This is called Gargantua. So here we see this pear-shaped um, <coughs> monarch. And um, here's a group of taxpayers. And they've all been assembling here to pay their money. And they're putting coins into these baskets. And the baskets full of money are being taken up this ramp. And the money is being poured into the mouth of this monarch. So here's a tax eater. And he's sitting on a commode, which is the polite French way of saying a toilet. And... Um, Falling from the commode <laughs> are all these government privileges and subsidies which are being grabbed um, by um, all these um, supporters and beneficiaries of the, of the state and being taken off to the um, assembly, the chamber. So this is uh, Dormier's view of how the state operates and the, the whole purpose of taxation. And this was very much, I think, in um, sympathy with what Bastiat is, is thinking and saying at the same time. But let's look at the petition of the candle makers. Um, the petition of the candle makers is a very good example of Bastiat's style. <clears throat> and this is on page two. And this, uh, this, the technique he uses here is the reductio ad absurdum. He takes a, an argument used by the opposition and pushes it to such an absurd degree that even a supporter of that idea would come to see this is nonsense, this is crazy. So what do um, manufacturers, domestic indust in industrials say to the government? They say, um, we're being hurt by competition from overseas. The British are undercutting our prices. If you want to have a strong industry in this area in France, you should keep out these British products. And that will provide us with all sorts of employment opportunities. You will get taxes and there will be a, f a flourishing French economy. So Bastiat takes that idea and says, well, let's apply it to something else. And this is, this is how he does it. He says, a petition from the manufacturers of candles, tapers, lanterns, candlesticks, street lamps, snuffers, extinguishers, da 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 da, da to the honourable members of the Chamber of Deputies. Gentlemen, you are on the right track. You deserve, you reject abstract theories and have little regard for abundance and low prices. You're con you concern yourselves mainly with the fate of the producer. You wish to free him from foreign competition, that is to reserve the domestic market for domestic industry. And then they tell, uh, tell him about all the horrible consequences they suffer because of um, the importation of whatever. Go to the, the, the last paragraph, which is in bold. We ask you to be so good as to pass a law requiring the closing of all windows, dormers, skylights, inside and outside shutters, curtains, casements, bullseyes, dread, deadlights and blinds. In short, all openings, holes, chinks and fissures through which the light of the sun is wont to enter houses to the detriment of the fair industries with which we are proud to say we have endowed the country, a country that cannot, without betraying ingratitude, abandon us today to so unequal a combat. So the argument is, imagine how much industrial activity, jobs and so on could be provided to the artificial light industry if you forced everyone to close their windows when the sun's up. And he says this is exactly the same argument that every protectionist says to the government to, in, to, to please keep out foreign competition because it's cheaper, uh, it harms uh, domestic industry. 
And this is the sort of thing that Bastia excelled at, writing witty stories uh, like this one. Um, the Seen and the Unseen is another one, and I might um, close on that. Um, this is one of his most uh, famous uh, quotations. It's on page uh, six, sorry, page five of the handout. And the argument behind this is that um, we hear this all the time. And in fact, uh, I heard some, a conversation out, outside uh, before the lecture began about the earthquake in Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, someone was saying, how long will it be before we hear that someone say in the press, uh, yes, it's a terrible thing what's happened to Christchurch. Uh, a third of the downtown area has to be demolished because all the buildings have been destroyed. But think of all the employment opportunities that that will provide for the construction industry. <coughs> And this is what Bastiat called the broken window fallacy. And he says that the same thing happens. Some guy has a shop with a window in it. The window gets broken somehow. Perhaps there's another revolution and someone's throwing rocks and uh, <laughs> happens to break his window. But um, the argument is, well, this is actually good for the economy because what it does, it will stimulate the industry of the glazier. The glazier will have to produce more glass. He will employ people. Um, he will then make a sale. And so the glass industry will be um, benefited. Bastia says, yes, that might be true, but think of it from the point of view of the person whose window has just been broken. They now have to spend, let's say, 20 francs getting the window repaired, um, which is a loss to them. <coughs> that 20 francs might have been spent somewhere else. That is the unseen. The seen is that the glazier's industry might be uh, stimulated and promoted by a broken window. The unseen is what would the... Um, person who had the broken window have spent that money on instead. He would have bought a new pair of shoes, which would have stimulated the, uh, the shoe industry. He might have bought a book with that money, which would have stimulated the book selling industry. He might have bought a chicken um, to serve his family on the weekend. So the, the farmer will now suffer um, a loss of trade. And so Bastiat says there's no way in the world that destruction can actually benefit society as a whole. It might benefit a couple of sectors, but it will not benefit society as a whole. And that's what he calls the, the broken window fallacy. And um, I would strongly recommend that you read that in full because it's a very subtle and uh, interesting um, argument. I have a couple more cartoons, which I'm uh, see if I've got time to show you. I've shown you the gargantua. And the oh, I should show you another one here. This is similar to Bastiat's theory of the state. This is called the Army Hierarchy. And this is, again, a Dormier um, cartoon. And here we have the general whipping the colonel. He's whipping the lieutenant. He's whipping the guy at the bottom who has no one else to whip. You know, he's at the bottom of the pecking order. And uh, I would suggest that not only is this a, the Army Hierarchy, but it might also be the State Hierarchy. Um, Bastiat was um, <coughs> remembered very fondly by his friends and colleagues. In 1878, they raised money to build this monument um, in Mougron. And um, there was a bust, a bronze bust of him at the top. And then there's an interesting figure here. This is the personification of fame. And she is um, leaning against the um, bottom of the statue and writing the names of his most famous writings, economic sophisms, the law, and so on. And... Um, when the Nazis invaded France in 1940, um, after the, a couple of years, they were running out of um, supplies for munitions. And so they had all bronze statues in France um, stripped of their bronze and so to, to build um, new war material. And so this was the, the, the bust and the statue of fame was, was stripped and melted down which, of course, would have horrified Bastiat because of his op opposition to war in all its forms. After the Second World War, they were able to find the mould to rebuild the bust at the top, but they could never find the mould for the statue at the bottom. So that um, was un unfortunate. This is... That figure there is really all that they have left in Mougron. When the, um, the French um, circle Bastiat had its had a conference in France in 2001 to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Bastiat's birth. 
the citizens of Mugro uh, were very puzzled about why all these people had come to their small country town, and especially so many Americans, because uh, they'd never heard of Bastia, um, and they had no idea why he was important. Um, so we're trying as best we can to remedy that situation and tell the world why Bastia is a very important um, person that we should all take an interest in. So I'll um, open up for questions now. Please feel free to ask me anything. The limericks. The limericks. Well, I was running out of time. Um, maybe since you insist. Um, <laughs> um, now, Bastia would have loved this cartoon. Um, this is a bit like the scene in the unseen. And here we have a man at, at a table, a desk, with state sector jobs, sorry, private sector jobs, and he's gradually losing all the threads. <laughs> and at the other end is we have um, Obama knitting his jobs using the same material as the private sector guy. Um, so here, here are a couple of limericks. I'll just give you one um, before I get on to the rock band. Um, there once was an arch anti-statist who thought the state's dangers were greatest when those whom it favoured ruled those whom it fettered with statutes that made them the strongest. Or if you want to have that one about tariffs. Tariffs is actually very hard to rhyme, um, as I'm sure you'll <laughs> appreciate. There once was a critic of tariffs who argued restrictions are rip-offs. Consumers are plundered, trade rivals are hindered, and commerce in all quarters drops off. <laughs> so pardon my rhyming. <laughs> and then... Um, Do anyone, does anyone know who this guy is? Um, Freddie Mercury and Queen, yes. Um, so I've, I transposed Bastiat's head onto Freddie Mercury's body. <laughs> uh, I hope he doesn't mind, uh, both Bastiat and Mercury. But I thought that some of the songs that uh, Frederick Bastiat's band might sing, Freddie and the Free Traders, um, I Can't Get No Liberation, based on the, the Rolling Stones' I Can't Get No Satisfaction. The Beatles' Let It Be could become Laissez-Faire, Remi rhymes quite nicely, I think. Oh, Stairway to Freedom, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> or F Freddie Mercury and Queen sang a crazy little thing called Love. I've called it Crazy Little Thing Called Trade. <laughs> or Edwin Starr's song War, What Is It Good For? Well, obviously, you don't have to change any of the words uh, to suit Bustia. Or the Beatles' uh, song Taxman yeah. would obviously be a favourite, I think, for the Bustia crowd. But as I said, if you can think of other songs um, that you should, we should add to that lineup, uh, please let me know, and the best one will win a free copy of Volume 1. <laughs> so I'm sorry I went over time. Do we have time for 15? Five minutes? Okay. Yes, sir. What was Bastiat's opinion about the state and what fire departments and um, other sorts and of courts. and courts? Well, Bastiat, being the, the sort of limited uh, the minicus that he was, thought the government should run the court system. That was one of its um, essential uh, functions. With um, police uh, fire departments, I would think that that would be a grey area. He would probably come down in favour of um, voluntary associations providing <coughs> that service and perhaps even charging for it. But it's not something that he, he raised. That wasn't an issue in the 1848 revolution. And I, I never came across him saying anything about it, but that would be my hunch. If it could be provided voluntarily, he would favour that. There are these horror stories back in American history when we had these subscription yes. fire departments. I don't know, I'm not a historian of that, but there were stories that the fire department would arrive and see, well, that's not our... Yes. or they would arrive and well, they hadn't paid up, so we're going to put that house out. I don't know. That happens now. Yes, there was an example of that. Um, I think he would say that you know, there are strong economic, not economic incentives for private producers to um, win goodwill by offering their services and then charging the person afterwards. And if they refuse, then they become a pariah and uh, socially ostracized uh, by their community. Yes, sir? Um, what, were, what was uh, Bob Piazza's views on taxation? Did he favor 
favored what's called direct tax or what would be called indirect tax? He believed in a 5% um, tariff, revenue raising only. And uh, at this time, um, there was no income tax to speak of. There was a land tax and there was indirect taxes on a whole lot of goods and services, and he wanted that to be low, and 5% was considered very low. But he, he was against direct tax? Yes. Yes, sir. So um, what, what would you say was Basquiat's understanding of where rights come from? What was the sort of foundation of, of the, that the whole philosophy is built on? Well, he would, I think, um, put it in much the same words as you find in the American um, Declaration of Independence, that it was a mixture of a kind of um, God that directed the universe as well as human nature. So in, in, his talk, in his writings, he talks about the two as sort of being equivalent or being very closely related. Um, so secularists can read it as a sort of purely from, na from natural observation about hu who human beings are and how they function. Those who have a, a, a godly view of the th would, would, would see it as being, as being a gift of God or the Creator. But it's definitely in that tradition. Um, in the right of the back. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, Cobden's influence on his free trade views. Yes. Is there any evidence that, um, actually kind of a follow-up, that he uh, was influenced at all by... Um, John Locke in his uh, rights... Uh, no, I, never, I haven't come across any references directly to John Locke. Um, when, in volume one that's coming out uh, next month, there's a, a lot of references to people like Robespierre, Rousseau. Um, they were his big antagonists in the 18th century. I, I haven't seen any references to any 17th century <coughs> authors. So. Yes, sir. Uh, I have Robert Bastet's book, The Law. Yeah. He said he was afraid that Marxism would crush American capitalism. And he spoke to the Daughters of the American Revolution in, in, uh, in uh, French Connecticut. And uh, he was a management consultant <coughs> trained by J. General Electric. He had a good manager. Okay? And, uh, I have uh, blood and blood mice books between the two wars, okay? I am a disciple of Adam Smith and uh, a disciple of, of Frederick Bastiat and uh, blood and blood mice. Okay? Yeah. So anyway, you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> well, that's one reason why um, Fee has been so important in keeping Bastiat's writings in print for the past 50 years and why it's now time to um, discover more of Bastiat's writings, which is what Liberty Fund is now trying to offer people. Um, yes, in the back, right. How did Paul Krugman of the New York Times get away with saying that the World Trade Center disaster would uh, make economic uh, uh, sense for the United States. Yeah. He printed that in the New York Times, and the building was never destroyed, meaning the New York Times building. <laughs> <laughs> well, the um, Bastiat does refer in in a couple of places in his writings to the Great Fire of London. And this was often referred to by supporters of government intervention in, in the 18th and 19th century as a good example of, you know, the Great Fire of London of 17, or 1666, I think it was, um, destroyed large numbers of buildings in London and this stimulated the construction industry in, in, in England. And this would be a good thing. And wouldn't it be a good thing if this happened to Paris and we could get all these new buildings? And, uh, and Bastiat is horrified. He says, well, how, this is just absolutely crazy. I mean, it's, uh, he looked at the... Um, he tried to do some, a sort of uh, back-of-the-envelope calculations. You know, what would be the capital stock lost 
if a fire like the Great Fire of London swept through Paris. And he said this would be catastrophic. It would be a huge uh, net loss to the community. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I think, the absolute absurdity of, of that whole line of argument. He said, well, think of all the things we could have been buying with the money that we would be spending on new buildings. I mean, we could be, you know... Because what Bastiat did was he would buy books. I mean, that's what he would do. <laughs> he, um, he knew Richard Cobden, and uh, when Richard Cobden was travelling in Italy, uh, Bastiat wrote to him and said, um, oh, by the way, if you happen to come across this 50-volume um, collection of 18th century Italian political economists, could you pick me up a copy? <laughs> and... Uh, Cobden said, sure, and he posted it to Bastia, 50 volumes, um, which was uh, incredibly generous. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Um, I'm new to Bastia. Um, it filled a great number of blanks when I read the law a couple of weeks ago. We have the unions right now, a monopoly. We had, before that, it was maybe the employer was a monopoly, and we had the government, which is the state's government. How does Bastia, I need to help here, fill in the blanks to manage monopolies that abuse the system and really overpower everybody else. Well, in his day, the, the monopolies were all government-supported. Um, right. I mean, they would either be a blanket ban on competition or they would be uh, factories that would be subsidised by the government to produce certain things and others were denied access to that line of work. Um, he would say that it's the... If you have vigorous free trade, that is one way in which you can keep domestic monopolies under control. I mean, if you can, why should I buy something from you if I can get it cheaper across the border in Spain? I mean, that uh, limits the power that you might ha want to have as a, as a monopoly supplier. Um, if the, uh, someone produces goods who do, in fact, produce the cheapest good at the best price, then even if they are large, as long as they keep providing that service, then good luck to them. He would say as soon as you get lazy and as soon as you start to abuse your position in the market, that's an opportunity for other people to step in and start offering uh, goods at a competitive price. What happens, though, is manufacturers, when they see competition in increasing, instead go to the government and say, we're suffering all these um, um, costs because of increasing competition. Can you fix things? Keep out these pesky... Uh, this is the fallacy of uh, you know, the petition of the candle makers. That's, what, that's when pe people use their dominant position in the market to get even further um, benefits from the state. Bastia would say that as long as there was free competition, especially um, international competition, that would help keep um, would-be monopolists under control. Uh, one more question, please. One more question. We haven't had any from this side. Do you want over there in the corner? The 5% tax would not be paid for everything the government needed. How would he propose to make up the shortfall? Uh, if Bastia only wanted a 5% um, tariff to pay for government, um, what did, would he think government would have to do if, it, if its expenses exceeded that amount of revenue? Um, I don't think he could imagine the government ever being needing to be any bigger than that. Um, uh, he would probably say that maybe fee for service would be a possibility, but he really wanted the government to do very, very little. And he thought that the revenue that would that five percent tariff would produce would be far more than the government would ever need. He also had the unseen, and my question was: the what? Unseen. What is the unseen? Well, maybe it would have to go to six percent. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no. The unseen is that the government. Would have to... okay. Thank you.